All right, welcome back and thanks for joining me today. Um, as you all know, April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month and we're closing in on Denim Day. Um, so for those of you that are unfamiliar with Denim Day, um, it's basically a day on April 28th when millions of people across the world will wear jeans with a purpose. Uh, and this purpose is to support survivors and educate themselves and others about sexual violence. Um, you can find out more about Denim Day and the history of the of the event at denimday.info.org. Um, so please put on your denim and post to social media using the hashtag CO Denim Day and Denim ACC um, and join us in solidarity and promoting a, a well worth event. If you or someone that you know is in need of nas um, national resources, please check out some of these organizations. Uh, we have the Blue Bench, RAIN, National Sexual Violence Resource Center, uh, and many others. On campus, we have the Dean of Students Office, Campus Police, and the Colorado Crisis Services. Um, so joining us today for our conversation about the culture of respect are two of ACC's very own professional staff members, Erica Henningsen and Jennifer Hewson. Uh, Erica is a faculty member in our psychology department and Jennifer is our associate dean of students in equity and compliance and title IX officer and has a very long title. Um, so thank you both very much for joining us today for this discussion. So glad we're here. I was thinking last night that this might be the first time that the three of us have been back together as a group since our professional development trip to New Orleans. And that seems like a long time ago at this point. It does seem like a long time ago. Oh my God, it's pre-pandemic, right? But right when everybody was just starting to talk about what's this COVID thing on the other side of the world. Here we are still, still just trucking through, but we're on the, the other side of it as they tell us. So, uh, Hopefully looking forward to getting back in person together with you all. But um, so let's let's just kind of go over this real quick. So for our audience that may not know, um, what is the culture of respect and how will this impact the ACC community? So the culture of respect is, is a national initiative that is uh, sponsored by NASPA, which is um, the one of the national student affairs professional organizations. And um, they have been working on, um, on basically a, a, a way to assess and improve your organization related to um, understanding awareness, education, prevention around sexual violence, sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. And so really looking at it as a, a system-wide um, approach that it's not just educating students, it's not just informing policy, it's not just programming, but it really is all of those things to, and more to be able to really affect change and to, and to build, as the title says, a culture of respect on campus when it, in, in addressing and supporting um, issues related to sexual violence. Things have changed a lot since, you know, just, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I was in college and the conversations that are happening now and things like that. Um, what are some of the major trends that you guys have seen in this area of work over the past 10, 10 or so years that have impacted what's being done today? Well, it's very interesting because I think we're talking more um, about issues around sexual assault. I don't think the sexual assaults or sexual harassment has changed. I just think we're starting to talk about it more. And I do think that social media has played a pretty significant role in facilitating um, those national conversations and global conversations even. Absolutely. When I think, you know, hashtag me too really um, started something, uh, but it wasn't something that wasn't already there. It was just really getting that conversation out there and going because, um, I, I put it in a similar category as mental illness, that there's stigma in talking about it. Um, and there, you know, mental, mental health um, and sexual violence do have some connection to one another because um, there is a lot of fear, um, shame, um, and impact on mental health and coming forward and talking about it. And, um, and, that's, and that's really unfortunate, but I'm hoping that really what's changed is that we can talk about this more and when we like there's a lot more campaigns out there nationally and locally about um about start, starting by believing people which is not necessarily where I think society was all the time I think it was a lot of victim blaming which is not um not a healthy or safe place to be for any person that's experienced sexual violence what's up buddy <laughs> 
little sidekick for the day. So I like the last bullet point you have on here um, as well, Brian, that um, you know we're making progress and we can celebrate um, the progress that is being made and be hopeful um, towards um, what the future might hold. And as we continue this conversation, um, we still have work to do um, as a society um, because I think there's still that kind of gut reaction when you hear something um, about sexual assault. Um, and it, it comes from this really purely, um, you know, um, safety perspective. We want, uh, we want to believe that we are safe as individuals. And so uh, it's called the just world hypothesis. It's a cognitive bias. When we hear that bad things happen to other people, it's very human nature to say, oh, they must have done something to deserve that. And if I don't do that, I am safe. So um, I think we also need to start looking at just some cognitive biases and how those influence our perceptions of things like uh, sexual assault as well. Yeah, it really is. Um, it really is human nature. I think I love how you worded that because I, I re we, I don't know if it's a way that our our bodies want to protect ourselves and that we just react that way, um, but it's it really is just um, counter to what we really need to do um, when situations like that arise. What can we do to better educate our communities about sex um, sexual assault prevention? Well, um, I, I'll start off. Um, consent, teaching about consent and what that actually means um, is a really good place to start and it should not start in college. Um, it sh and it doesn't need to be applied to sexual situations either. Um, we can start teaching children about consent. Um, you know, it can be something like, and I use this all the time with my kids who are currently 12 and 14. And you know, they love to push each other's buttons as siblings want to do and get in each other's space and get into each other's rooms and things like that. And um, I am frequently trying to get them to think about that in terms of consent. Did you give your brother consent um, or did you ask for consent to be in your sister's room? Or did you ask for consent to use um, you know, your brother's markers? Um, just so that consent um, is kind of like the foundation for all human interaction. That's what I'm hoping to teach um, my, my children. Yeah, this shouldn't be new in college. And unfortunately, it probably, it probably is for um, some college students um, to hear and talk about this um, more openly. And you're right, it really does need to start at such a, a younger age. I think about my kids, and they're a little bit younger than yours, but I even talk about, um, we've had conversations about uh, grandparents, oh, go kiss your grandma, go, you know, go sit, go give them a hug. No, if that's not what they want to do, like, why would I force that? Where's their consent? If they say no, no, they're not gonna do it. Nope. Okay, you don't, you don't have to. Um, and so that they start to understand their own boundaries and where they can say no. I have a three-year-old, but he says no to everything. So, you know, it is still a fine line of uh, teaching them, you know, what are rules and what are things that are expected as your parents telling you what to do, but then also, you know, helping them understand that they can set their own boundaries um, early on um, in everything like that. But, um, but, but consent is, is foundational to, to the work here that um, we need to be openly talking about what we want to do and what we don't want to do um, and what we're interested in, what we're not interested in. So when it, when it comes to sex, it, like just talking about that can be, um, for some reason it can be challenging, but it really shouldn't be um, because if we're going to freely engage in something, we should be able to put words to that, not just actions. Absolutely. I love the point that you guys brought up about teaching that at a young age, because, you know, my, my head initially went to, and I, don't know if we all had this experience, but there was, you know, generally in my, you know, elementary, middle school years, a student that, you know, was just 
very outgoing and wanted to hug everybody. And generally that was, you know, accepted amongst our community um, and how that, you know, condition that student to a certain point, And then they get to college where, you know, this behavior is, you know, interpreted differently and that's not necessarily an acceptable behavior um, and how hard it is to change habits that we create, you know, whether it's, you know, learning how to throw a baseball the right way when you've been throwing it wrong for so long. Um, and, you know, we, we understand that our children learn things much easier than we do, you know, with all of our bad habits that we form over years. Um, so I think that's a great point of, you know, starting it early and, and beyond just sex, right? Like mm -hmm. whether it's talking to grandma or, um, you know, getting a ride to the airport or whatever it might be. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it, it's something that needs to be practiced, right? It's a skill. Um, and the more that you put yourself out there and try these things, the better off you're going to be at it. Um, but I think a lot of the times people are, you know, fearful of having that conversation, maybe to some degree, right? The, mm -hmm. How do I bridge this conversation when I don't know what I'm talking about or I don't know what I'm feeling or experiencing at this time? So mm -hmm. um, there's such a vulnerability in putting stuff out there. Um, but we consent every day to so many things. Um, and and it's something we do need to talk about further. How many times on our cell phones do we like, oh, here's this terms and agreement, just you know, scroll down, click this. Um, what are you actually agreeing to? Like, shouldn't you take a moment? Like, wouldn't that just make more sense um, in so many cases? Um, um, but you know, I think I think human nature is designed to trust a little bit. Um, and I, I think that that's, that should be core still in building relationships, there should be trust. Um, but um, we've also, we are in a society where there is power in, um, in different identities and that, um, that has created some inequity. And that's really where I think we've gotten to a point where we need to talk about um, and really make sure consent, it's a two-way street that it is between two people, it's relational. Um, it's not just one person giving consent. It's another, it's another person asking. It's that together. And I think asking very specifically might be some of those things that, that make people fearful, right? When you look at some of these, these questions that you might ask in these situations, right? How does that feel? Do you want to try this? Do you like when I, whatever, like reading these to myself, like I almost feel immature because it's like, do people really ask these specific questions, right? Like, is that the, um, but like becoming comfortable with that is going to do wonders for people. Um, mm -hmm. Well, we think in any place where we grow, we're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Any place we grow. Um, and we can grow here too. Yeah. I'd like to think that sex only gets better with time. Um, and so, gosh, you know, like we only get better at it as we practice in the same way with consent, not just sex. <laughs> You know, well, I think some of that discomfort comes from, um, you know, being raised in a society as a whole, um, that there's just a lot of shame around sex and sexuality. And certainly, you know, different families um, have different approaches to how open, um, you know, conversations and discussions around sex are. Um, but as a whole, our society is pretty, um, uh, pretty shame-based when it comes to um, sex. And so we learn from a very early age um, to have discomfort. Um, we learn that it's something we shouldn't openly talk about. Um, another thing that I'm a big proponent of is when it comes to, you know, reproductive anatomy to use the actual terms, um, you know, but parents, oftentimes caregivers, not out of any malicious intent, like to give little cutesy names instead of referring to a vulva or a penis or testicles. Um, we give them the little cutesy names because it makes us feel more comfortable. But inadvertently, we are teaching children from an incredibly young age that these are parts of our body that we have to code, um, you know, call it in, in terms that are kind of coded instead of what they are. There's something different about breasts than there is about an elbow because of the of the the language we use. And so, you know, some of that, I think the discomfort about talking about consent and um, in an intimate setting, you know, what you're interested in doing and finding out what a partner is interested in doing um, 
that that can be really hard to overcome for some people. Well, I know movies aren't life, but if either of you have seen um, Friends with Benefits with Justin Timberlake and Mila Kunitz, I watched it recently. I think it was on Amazon Prime. And there was a great example in that film of, of having those conversations, right? Like they were in it, you know, it was maybe came from a humorous standpoint because it's a comedy, but like the, they were actually interacting with each other and saying like, this is what I like, this is what I don't like. And I'm not saying that every, you know, interaction turns into this, you know, great blossoming relationship, but I think that that foundation allowed for them to maybe grow as individuals throughout that process too. So um, to your point, I think it's important to, you know, when we're talking with the kid children, to you know treat the topic as serious as it is and not make it as playful um, just because of their age group like treat it the way that it needs to be treated I think it's uh, something also that can change with generations I think we will we will continue to improve this over time as I you know I think I think about my own kids and kind of how they perceive things uh, I'll tell you my parents who spend a lot of time with uh, their grandkids um, are always surprised when my three-year-old talks about his penis um, and uses the term penis. And so it, they're like, what's with all this? I'm like, well, you know, he's three. He, this is just what he does right now. He's fascinated with it. Um, but, you know, they're surprised at the language of it. And, you know, talking to them and educating them, um, but seeing that generational shift, um, I think, you know, this is, this is, a, this is something that I think society-wise we can continue to work at and overcome. I mean, there's a lot that needs to happen, but this is something we can continue to move on. If a, if a person is um, struggling with how to do that because they're so uncomfortable um, talking about um, um, sex with a partner, um, one thought is for them to get um, you know, some type of erotica book um, and they can just go back to um, you know, elementary school where you do read alouds and just take turns reading the book just as a like a little baby step to maybe increase that comfort level. As somebody th that that is trained to investigate these type of complaints if they were to come up at the college um, it's something we talk about when we train our investigators like you've got to be able to say the words um, to be able to talk about this and so Eric I love that example like let's say it out loud like hear yourself saying those words um, so that you can get comfortable there. And I think even now, um, you know, we may not be in a situation because of COVID where we're interacting in the same ways and, you know, maybe having, um, you know, meet cutes at the bar or wherever it may be happening. Um, but right now the, the virtual world is also very important for sexual assault awareness, whether it's, you know, like you're seeing here, someone sending you a, a naughty picture, a dirty text or something like that, or just people dealing with intimate partner violence that they now live with 24 seven. This pandemic right now has created um, so much um, potential for harm. And we know harmful situations for people that are living with, um, with their abusers um, or in violent situations with family. Um, and that does, doesn't, that's not just limited to um, sexual violence or domestic or dating violence, um, that, that violence is overall. Um, but um, so like, we know that that's a reality that a lot of people are living in. And um, it, it is hard um, to get out of those situations right now with the, with the current conditions. But gosh, I mean, everything, everything we do now is digital, right? We, we meet people online, we don't meet up. Um, we gotta be able to talk about certain things and answer stuff and, um, and like, and, but do that in a digital format. Like I, I can't imagine dating right now um, and going through that um, in this world right now, but, um, but they're also, but it's, it's the same thing. It's just in a digital format. Where do we, where do we have our boundaries and where do we keep those? Um, and then where are we comfortable in talking about certain things before we even meet somebody? Um, because yeah, the, the pictures, that's a whole, that's a whole nother thing. Yeah. And then there, there's some issues, some legal issues that people can get into, especially, um, depending on the age of, um, the person uh, whom the images are being shared. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We know this is covered so much more in, um, in elementary and high school education um, than it probably ever was. And so, you know, as we think of a more informed 
college body and even at a community college our you know our students range from eight to 88 in my mind um, that they're coming into college no matter what age with a little bit more foundational information than they had before about this um, but they're also digital natives they've they've lived in this or assimilated to it um, as to this is how society works now um, but we also it, it goes back to you know it's an area where still people push boundaries significantly how many times do we consent to stuff electronically without looking at it? We don't have, we can block people, but can we actually set a boundary with somebody um, through text message? That's hard. That is hard. And I think too, sometimes we give these messages uh, that are, I think, designed to be encouraging and empowering. Um, this idea that, um, you know, if you like someone, ask them out or, you know, whatever. Um, and if um, they say no, just keep trying, you know, don't give up, you, you keep try harder. Um, and then that can escalate, I think, to, you know, if you're doing it on text, because certainly text messages is a uh, little less intense than that doing anything face to face, um, even, you know, asking someone out on a date. But if they say no, you know, and then you're like, okay, what else can I do to impress this person? Um, you know, and add different things in, I'm, you know, keep talking, maybe send those, those photos, uh, suggestive photos to be, to, you know, try to be enticing. And that's where we start running into some really significant problems. So on one hand, we're telling people, gosh, don't give up. If you want something, you go for it. Um, but then we, also have to, which is not a bad message necessarily, but there also has to be an, a message that is taught at the same time or provided at the same time. That is, you also need to respect other people's boundaries. You know, it's not just about you because like Jen said earlier, you know, this is, um, these are relationships. Um, it is a relational process um, and all parties' views count. I think that's even where uh, media and uh, movies can sometimes paint, you know, the incorrect picture um, and really play to stereotypes. Because um, I think when we talk about sexual violence, people want to hear that it's um, a women's issue, a female issue, and it's very gendered. Um, and statistically, it may be more significant, but it's not. It, it, it's not just a, a one-sided thing. And really that's where I think media has really painted a, a, neg a wrong picture of kind of where violence um, like this exists and where, um, and the stereotypes of what, what is masculine and what is feminine and to be pursued um, and all of that is, um, is antiquated in my mind. Like, I think it's just, it's not, it's not where society is anymore. Um, and so really needs to, it needs to move and we need to get an updated picture of what is, what does this really look like in our society? Because it's also unseen, unreported um, in, in a lot of communities because there's a lot of distrust out there. Um, and because of our criminal justice system, sometimes it also, um, people don't feel like they're gonna be believed and they don't wanna report it. Um, and I, I see you've got, I get on my, I'm gonna get on my soapbox a little bit, but if, if I could keep going, um, we can like, we can see it when we look at minoritized communities on the screen and where the numbers, um, the percentages and impact in different communities of color, we really can see um, the intersectionality of this issue and that it isn't, we can't just look at it from a gendered perspective because really we, we bring multiple identities to any interaction and when it comes to sexual violence, it can be um, it can be more highly impacted when we add on multiple identities in a situation. Yeah, and so I'm going to tag on a couple of things. Um, the first part with media, the role of media in perpetuating some problematic ideas. Um, I haven't done the analysis, but my guess is the majority of rom coms are going to have some aspect of the storyline that is um, what um, feeds this idea of don't take no for an answer. If you really like that person, go after them and don't stop until they agree to go out with you, until they see how wonderful you are. 
Um, and it's done in, in such a, you know, humorous way and kind of just, you know, leaves you with a feel good feeling that we're not, we don't realize the impact that those messages um, might have. Um, and then regarding the, the gendered issue and the intersectionality of um, other minoritized groups, Jen is absolutely correct. It's, you can't look at it just through one lens. The other thing is um, a topic that is not discussed as much and needs to be is that um, men can also be victims of sexual violence. Um, and I think in many ways, um, a, not a competition, but the, there's a unique problem there um, because our society also teaches men, says men have to be tough and strong. And if you're a victim, you're not going to fit that. And so therefore we're going to um, question your masculinity if you weren't able to defend yourself from something. And so I think that also um, means that male victims um, are even less likely to report um, sexual violence um, because it's, they kind of get this double whammy of stigma. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the <clears throat> the most common forms of sexual verbal harassment towards men is being purposely misgendered or called homophobic or transphobic slurs. Um, and, you know, I had never really looked at it that way in the past. And, you know, being around a lot of locker rooms, you hear a lot of different things said. Um, and, you know, we were talking about how society and how generational gaps and all of these things come into play. And, and I really see this, you know, ringing true where it's like, now there's an awareness of, oh, where, well, where was I 10 years ago and when this was happening? Like, was I a part of the problem? Was I a part of the solution? Did I have any idea that this was happening? Um, and they're finally starting to have a lot more statistics about men in this topic. Um, it, you know, I think a lot of times it's assumed that the men is the, the perpetrator. Um, and that's, you know, kind of our responsibility is to stop being, you know, perpetrators, so to speak. Um, but realizing that that this happens across all identities is, um, you know, I think another way to bring everybody else to the table as well. We have to be able to really get past um, those gender stereotypes. Um, and that's, and that's, again, only going to take time and effort and individual conversations um, and experiences where, um, where, where we really learn respect um, for one another um, and understanding the identities that people hold and how they bring themselves to different situations. Like that, that is more than just sexual violence um, conversation. That really is um, really where our society needs to uh, evolve when it comes to uh, gender, race, and, um, consider and understanding really intersectionality of identities. So, you know, we've been talking about how we know that this happens to all people and the numbers actually impact some identity groups at higher rates than others. Um, what are some of these other contributing factors um, that lead to these higher rates? Well, we know statistically that all of this is underreported across all groups. So starting there, that numbers only paint a certain um, percentage of the picture um, of everything, but you know, this isn't isolated to any one population um, in thinking about, you know, who it's impacting more. It's just, um, I don't know if I have a great answer for this one. There's just, a, there is a lot more factors that go, that um, are at play when it, um, in, in these types of situations and identity is part of that for sure. And I think that, you know, minoritized groups um, already bring with them um, an identity that sometimes, um, I mean, they, they don't have as much power. And so with sexual assault, that power differential um, it plays a huge role. Um, you know, people who are perpetrators of, of sexual violence um, can be very strategic in who they select as victims and who they think won't report or who that they can have enough power over to prevent them from reporting. Um, you know, children are easy victims because of that. Um, but anyone in a, a minoritized group where they're really at a, have limited power, if you think about um, trans folk, um, 
people already don't trust them because of these um, you know, stereotypes and perceptions of transgender um, and they don't believe them. So they are automatically, um, you know, they're not at the, the, they're not even at an even playing field at the beginning before they, they want to talk about, you know, I was sexually assaulted. Um, they start below the, the status quo. So I think those power differentials and who is believed and not believed in our society before sexual assault is an issue um, plays a role in um, why we might, at least in part, see some groups um, having higher rates of sexual assault than others. Uh, so each year, you know, we try to educate and raise awareness within our community by hosting events and doing, you know, campus things virtually like we are right now. Um, in terms of prevention, what else is ACC doing to help change this culture? And how can students get more involved around these topics? We always want students to get involved. Um, and we're, I, I think the first thing is we're open to always ideas of what students want to learn about and hear about and participate in. It's hard to answer this question in a pandemic because I feel like there's, we're missing the on-campus um, components of how we really can get this message out. Um, but we wanna make sure that students do hear from ACC in a variety of ways that this is an important topic to us um, and that we want people to understand consent, to know where resources are and to, um, to be able to get the support they need if they need that. So um, we've done a number of things over the years with a variety of different programs and resources. Um, we've worked at different points to try to get um, a club together. Um, if anybody's looked at It's On Us, um, it's, a, it's a great national organization, but they support student groups in getting together to um, support um, awareness and prevention on the college campuses. And so any students listening, if you're interested in this topic and want to get more involved, uh, reach out to any of us and we'll get you um, connected there. But the other important part is um, it's, it's not just programming, it's not just education, but it's also making sure that we have the right policies um, in place and we have a climate on campus um, that does have that, um, that awareness and understanding of believing students um, and supporting students and knows the resources to be able to get students to um, any support services that they might need. And so um, those are some of the other things that we do that students might not be aware of. We train annually when it comes to these, um, these topics. We want our employees to know who, um, who are our resources uh, for students and employees when it comes to sexual violence or sexual misconduct. Um, we, um, we have mental health therapists at ACC that are confidential resources. So if students need support and don't um, wanna speak directly to the college because they're afraid then, oh, it's gonna get reported somewhere. I'm gonna have to confront my accuser. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, there led me a lot of concerns in there, but if they need somebody confidential to talk to, that's why we have mental health counselors free for our students at ACC. And so we want, um, we want, we want students to know they're supported. So we train our employees annually about this topic so that it's, it's there. Um, it's also information that's shared um, in the student orientation for our students um, so that they know that this is a topic um, and there are resources available for, for our community. Also, I would like to add that um, in the psychology department, we have um, a human sexuality class, that three credit class, guaranteed transfer that I teach. So it's a little bit of a shameless plug for my own class. Um, but in the human sexuality class, we explore all kinds of things. We, um, we explore identity, we explore health, um, we explore relationships, um, we explore research, we explore um, sexual violence and sex work and, um, you know, a myriad of things. Um, so if, if students are interested in learning more about sexuality, broadly speaking, um, I also encourage them to and check out that class. ACC has tremendous resources, you know, on campus locally as well as nationally for students. Um, but Jen, you were kind of alluding to some, you know, some of these survivors may not feel comfortable, you know, talking to maybe a therapist or a professional staff member and thing like that. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times, 
the responsibility of support may fall to a friend or somebody close by. Um, mm -hmm. What are some tips or good things to remember for supporting our survivors? Well, number one is, um, number one is just to listen. Um, I think at any difficult conversation, when um, somebody comes to us for help, um, we get nervous as to, we don't know how we're going to respond to that concern um, because we don't know if we have the tools or resources to be able to help them. I'm gonna tell you to put that aside when somebody comes to you and especially if somebody comes to you and tells you that they've been the victim of, um, of sexual violence um, is just to listen, that they might need somebody to talk to and hear them. Um, and as that previous slide said, start by believing them. Like this isn't about questioning them this is not about um, you know, asking them about their own choices. This is just about listening and believing um, and seeing what they need because there's a lot of different resources out there. Um, and the first one is to feel supported uh, because if, they, if they've been victimized, then they, um, that has completely destroyed their any sense of trust. Um, and if they've come to you, um, then you're somebody that is in that circle with them. And so stay there in that circle with them and believe and listen. Um, and let, and know that there are options, um, to be, able, especially in the state of Colorado. Um, if somebody has been the victim of sexual violence, they, um, they are entitled to medical support without charge. Um, and so when we look, um, a lot of our local hospitals in Colorado. So, um, if you're local to Colorado, um, we have a great, uh, forensic nurse program. Sometimes it's been called, um, SANE nurses, um, which I can't think what that acronym means, um, but they're the ones that would um, do a forensic exam on somebody. And somebody's like, oh, I'm going to get an exam. And, you know, then they're going to call the cops. No, you can get an examination to make sure that you're safe um, from any, um, any injury, um, ex exposure to any um, diseases um, without um, it needing to be reported further um, to the police department. So that medical support is so important, especially after someone's been the victim of violence. So knowing that can happen without knowing that the police are going to be called is really is really important. And I think that's somebody something that people don't necessarily know. Also, if a report were to come to ACC, um, we as an institution are required to help somebody get that medical attention that they need. So if you were at an ACC campus and needed that support, um, our campus police would um, would happily transport you and get you over to um, to a medical provider to be able to get that assistance. And so we're required actually by state uh, statute to do that, something you might not know. Um, so we'll get we'll get people over to that support. So there's that medical um, and they can then collect that evidence. And then it's still if somebody has been the victim of a crime, they still don't necessarily have to have that medical um, forensic evidence that was collected then be reported also to um, the police for an investigation. It can be retained um, for a period of time. And if later someone that's been the victim wants to go forward with a police investigation, that evidence has been preserved. And so um, the great thing about our forensic nurses in Colorado, and I've met several of them, is that uh, they know these options and they are caring, compassionate souls um, to be able to help any victim um, going through this um, to be able to support them. And then there is the police response. Um, and know that um, our campus police, if, um, if you're close and local to uh, our campuses, would be happy to start um, and assist you with any of um, that processes. But they'd end up working with um, the local jurisdiction to be able to help you with that. And then there's campus. We want to support you too. So we've got resources um, but we also, if an incident were to happen related to two students, um, we'd want, we, um, we have ways that we would want to support um, any support and, and investigate if, um, if the victim was comfortable with it, any allegations. So there's a lot of different options. I feel like I went on a little bit of a rabbit trail there as to kind of reporting options in the state of Colorado, but um, I think students should know that. I think anybody should know that there, there is more than one way to address a concern. Um, when it comes to ACC, um, we, we do start by believing. We want to show that support and we want students to have the resources that they need. And if that means going forward with a, some sort of investigation, 
um, then, then that's what we'll do with, um, with the consent and permission of um, the person that's been victimized in, in the situation. But I want everyone to feel safe on campus. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean a, a full investigation. That doesn't necessarily mean the police. That means there might be some steps we can take to make people feel uh, more comfortable on campus after they've been a victim of an assault. So as friends and support members, um, shut your mouth and listen, um, really just be there, um, let them know there's options. And if you don't know what those options are, re-listen to this podcast, um, but then also um, reach out to somebody for support. Um, I think, you know, this is where, um, this is where being part of a college community can really help. And the Dean of Students office, the office I work in, um, we're there. Uh, our primary purpose is support and resources for students. And so contact us, even if like anonymously you want to talk through, hey, I had a friend tell me this and I don't know how to support them. We'll talk it through with you and help you out and get the, to help get you and them the resources that they need. I would add as a friend also, you know, be aware of your own reactions. You could get very angry, uh, which would be completely understandable um, if you have a, a friend who is, was a victim. Um, let your friend make the call about how they want to proceed. You may be all in like, I'm calling the cops, we're going to get you to the hospital, all of these things. But that those decisions need to ultimately be made uh, by your friend. And your, your job is to support them. You can say, I, I, can, I will research and find out information for you. I will go with you to the hospital. I will go with you to campus police. I will do whatever you need me to do, but give that decision-making power back um, to your friend because that power was stripped away from them. Um, and so, um, you know, just like Jen said, listen to them, support them, um, and then let, but ultimately let them make the call. That's all tremendous advice. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you guys so much for, for doing that. Wanted to just ad lib there. Sane, Sane Nurse stands for Sexual Assault Nurses Examiner. Um, it would have bothered me if I didn't think that I, I was trying to figure it out. So I wanted to just it put came that to me. Down. It would have came to me later. Um, they, they've been involved, involving the name to really just be forensic nurses, but yeah, a lot of people know them as sane uh, nurses. Well, I do want to be conscious of your time. I know Erica has another class coming up here in a couple of minutes, um, but I just wanted to give you guys an opportunity for any last thoughts or remarks um, before we go. Ooh, um, what a topic. Um, thanks, Brian, for getting us together to talk about this. I think it's really important um, it's really important to, um, to find your voice in this. Um, you know, is it, you know, it really is where are you comfortable? Is it your, is it really your individual power and what you do with other people and how you honor um, the partners that you have in your life um, and how you support your friends? Is it systemically? Um, how do you get involved on your college campus, um, in your community uh, to combat this type of violence? Is it, um, so putting in your time and effort there, is it, um, is it donating to the right, to the organizations that are supporting this great work? So um, know that in the Dean of Students Office, we're really, we are here to support our students with resources and support um, and follow up on situations of concern. Um, and so please reach out to us if we can help in some way with a situation um, beyond just um, sexual violence, but including, of course, sexual violence. Um, Brian's got on the screen the, um, the contact information for the Colorado Crisis Service, um, which it, it would be uh, remiss if we didn't at least mention them because they're, um, it is a commitment with the state of Colorado that anyone in Colorado could access mental health services that they need. So I think sometimes the name is misleading when it says crisis, because we think of crisis, we think emergency, but really the Colorado Crisis Service is the ability 24-7, 365 to talk to a mental health therapist. And so um, you can chat online with them, you can text with them, um, or you can call them. And then throughout the state of Colorado, there are various walk-in clinics um, that are available for any, um, any Colorado resident. And this is a free resource um, for anyone in Colorado. And so when we think about somebody might needing support, that can mean a lot of different things. Um, and mental health support might be one of them. And of course, our campus police department, um, I appreciate um, them and the work that they do 
and I believe that they are good partners with us um, if a situation like this were to happen um, on or connected to our campus um, and we'd work together to support our students. So, so speak up, do your part, find your role, find your voice that you can help, um, help end the stigma um, and help support um, victims of violence in our community. And I would add, um, you know, this is a difficult topic. Um, we know by statistics um, that um, sexual assault affects a great deal of people. Um, um, many individuals who are listening to the podcast um, may have experienced them or are very likely to at least know someone who has experienced sexual assault. So it can be a lot. Um, take care of yourself, be aware uh, that this might be um, kind of heavy or maybe even, uh, you know, triggering. Um, there's secondary trauma just from hearing things about this. Um, take care of yourself, be gentle with yourself um, as well. Do something good for yourself. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I truly, truly appreciate you coming on here and, and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, just want to remind students out there listening again, um, if you're interested in getting more involved and, you know, participating in some of these clubs or starting an organization to support this cause, please reach out to us and let us know. Um, Dean of Students Office is available, Colorado Crisis Service, and Campus Police. So, um, yeah, take care of yourselves and be good to each other.